Okay, well, hello everybody. Um, as I say, welcome, welcome to all those new people, including Liz, the the uh, the, the new president of the Mary Webb Society. No, um, no chair. Chair, I apologise. <laughs> yeah, I'm not quite been exalted to that level. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay um so today's going to be a bit of an experiment because as uh most of you probably know the most of the writings of mary webb come well into the into the 20th century um so what i'm going to look at is i'm going to look at the 19th century landscape and some of the the social conventions uh i must admit there's not as much farming in this as there was when i made the title so uh, forgive me on that. Plenty of mining, as you can see. And um, I'm going to look at some of the folklore and the uh, social conditions and the landscape around uh, Shropshire in the 19th century, which influenced Mary Webb. I'm going to focus on a three better known novels, which are um, The Golden Arrow, um, Gone to Earth and Precious Bane. And these mm -hmm. are the ones also that have the most folklore in them as well. Yeah. So uh, Mary Webb is, oh, actually, before I start, uh, yeah, for those of you who didn't, oh, hello, my screen is, there we go. Uh, I'm going to dedicate this talk to the mem memory of Gladys Mary Coles, the former president and the uh, biographer of uh, the main biographer of Mary Webb in her book, The Flower of Light. Um, as we hear, we unfortunately passed away earlier last month. Um, mm. I, I never actually met her, but I, I did correspond a little bit. So mm. uh, I'm entirely grateful for that help. Yeah. So this one's dedicated to her. So I'm hoping it's that. Lovely. Uh, mm. hopefully, lives up to it yeah okay so mary webb is often granted or perhaps relegated to the status of provincial writer mm. and it, it's perhaps understandable as she's best known as a shropshire author all of her five and a bit novels uh being based in the county for those of you who don't know england shropshire's the largest uh inland county and it runs along the border of wales um, Mary Webb was born 25th of March 1881 in a village called Leighton uh, in Shropshire, which is, for those of you who do know Shropshire, it's on the, the base of the, the Rekin Hill, uh, which is a very famous hill in the, in, in the county. Um, her parents, George Edward Meredith and Sarah Alice Meredith, niece Scott, um, George is an Oxford educated school teacher from a clerical family, and he has Welsh heritage, like many Salopians. Again, for those of you who don't know the terminology, Salopian is, is the word we use for people who come from the county of Shropshire. Um, he was keenly interested in literature and the arts, and he was a poet and an author in his own right, and he passed these passions on to his children. Sarah Alice was the daughter of an Edinburgh doctor, and she claimed a tenuous family link to Sir Walter Scott, the writer. Um, George had a deep love of Shropshire and its countryside, uh, and this is something Mary obviously inherited. Alice felt a little bit isolated in the rural surroundings, and eventually, when her husband passed away, she moved up to Chester. Um, slightly north, which is obviously a, a bit of a bigger town. Uh, Mary grew up surrounded with a love of literature uh, and nature, and she had siblings as well. Um, 1882, the year following her birth, the Merediths moved to a small market town uh, of Market Drayton. So we've got the, uh, the family there, we can see George and uh, um, and Sarah Alice Meredith and uh, her, her brother Kenneth, and this was the 
their house. Uh, they moved to much Wenlock. Um, it's a small market town, not too far from the area of Ironbridge, which was the centre of the uh, Industrial Revolution. Much Wenlock, on the other hand, is very rural area. It had until recently, possibly still does, actually farms inside the um, inside the village itself. Uh, I suppose village, it's, it's more of a small town now, I suppose. Um, Much Wenlock is known as the birthplace of the modern Olympics after a movement started in 1850 by uh, Dr. William Penny Brooks, who was later um, one of the founding members of the, of the modern Olympic Games. And so, uh, you know, there was a lot of sport and things. It included things like poetry reading, uh, lots and lots of uh, different disciplines involved in it. And they, they still run a version of it to this day. Uh, the town houses several holy wells, and it has the ruins of a 12th century uh, Cluniac monastery. Um, it was dissolved in 1540. Later, it was bought by the Gaskell family, uh, and uh, Charles and Lady Catherine uh, Gaskell became noted figures. They were society figures, and they entertained a lot of uh, people from society, including authors such as Henry James and some guy called Thomas Hardy, who some of you may have heard of. Um, young Mary didn't meet Hardy in these days, but the reason I mention him is that he was to become a major influence on her work. Um, her governess, uh, Edith Laurie, actually it was instrumental in expanding her reading and not least by introducing her to the works of Hardy, particularly Tess of the D'Urbervilles, which if anyone is familiar with uh, Mary Webb's book, Gone to Earth, I don't need to tell you that there are lots of um, similarities. Um, but this style of writing about uh, about rural matters, about regional matters, um, folklore, a lot of this we can see the parallels with Hardy. Um, another thing with Much Wenlock, here we go, we've got Thomas Hardy there, Lady Catherine, and the ruins of the monastery. Uh, another thing with Much Wenlock, which... Um, Possibly influenced influenced uh, Mary in some of her writings is around the area there are a number of limestone quarries. The name Much Wenlock, much meaning big, Wenlock meaning coming from Wen, which is white, and uh, Lock, I think it's uh, Old English for an enclosed area. So it's basically the big white place. Uh, and this comes partly from the, the limestone quarries. And in Gone to Earth, there's a scene where uh, Hazel, the, uh, the protagonist, is walking with her father to, um, to a church service where they're going to sing. And uh, they came to a quarry at the mountain. The deserted mounds and chasms looked more desolate than ever in the spring world. Here and there, the leaves of the young tree lipped with white, grey white steeps, as if wistfully trying to love them, as a child tries to caress a forbidding parent. They climbed around the larger heaps and skirted a precipitous place. I cannot bear this place, said Hazel. It's so drodsome. A while since, before you were born, a cow fell down that place, hundreds of feet. Did they save her? Laws, no, she was all of a jelly. Hazel broke out in a sudden passionate crying. Oh, dunna, dunna, she sobbed. She always did at any mention of helpless suffering. Um, the quarry in Gone to Earth is possibly an example of where Mary Webb actually combines various parts of the county. Uh, sometimes the geography is a little more fanciful than uh, in real life. And the, um, the author 
uh, the scholar Daniel E. Price in a 2014 article, Controlling Nature, Mary Webb and the National Trust, she actually suggests that the quarry in Gone to Earth is based on one of the quarries around Much Wenlock. Now, there had been uh, limestone quarrying for a substantial time, several centuries in the area, but with the growth of the Industrial Revolution, particularly in the locality, uh, the end of the 18th century and through the 19th century, several quarries uh, were opened and, um, and excavated. Do, do you excavate a quarry? Uh, dug up. And um, this one here, the Shadwell Quarry, actually continued in, late into the 20th century. And so uh, this might give us an example of the kind of the kind of image that Mary was thinking about when she was uh, when she was writing about her quarry and um, the landscape. So this is our, our 19th century influence here. Um, eventually, the family left um, Much Wenlock and moved to um, a, a village, Maysbrook, which is not too far from Shrewsbury. Um, which is the county town, and eventually moved to Mail Brace, which uh, is pretty much part of Shrewsbury now, but at the time was was still a, a village in its own in its own right. During this time, uh, Mary did uh, several things. She she was studying. She was uh, doing Cambridge courses uh, in uh, in Shrewsbury. And she uh, she also unfortunately had her first attack of what turned out to be Graves' disease. Uh, Graves' disease um, causes hypothyroidism and a lot of other things. There's a lot of psychological problems that can happen with it. Uh, one of the most obvious things that people are aware of is the bulging of the eyes, which was something she suffered with uh, later on in uh, through her life. Um, Unfortunately, she even at her young age there, in that picture she's around 15, even at that time of her life, she was quite into animal rights and uh, was embracing vegetarianism, which is not necessarily the best thing to do um, at that time because the, the, treatments, the treatments that were available involved animal products. And so she was often fed these things secretly not told what it was, um, and again later when she uh, when she developed pernicious anemia towards the end of her life, which eventually killed her, the new treatments at that time were again animal products. Um, and uh, had she known, it's questionable whether or not she would have chosen to to use them. Um, Nineteen ten, she meets. Uh, uh, Henry Webb, um, an Oxbridge-educated teacher, uh, a writer, and a, a translator. And they had a, a bit of a whirlwind romance. And um, he was also he was also a, a relative, I think he was the nephew of um, uh, Captain Matthew Webb, who became famous as the first man to swim the English Channel. Unfortunately, he later became famous as the person who didn't manage to swim the Niagara Falls. Um, so Henry was actually from quite an established Shropshire family. As I say, he was a teacher. Um, 1912, they marry. And uh, this brings us to our next point, Cross Houses Workhouse. Um, Cross Houses Workhouse. When she was living in Much Wenlock, Mary was involved in a lot of charity work, visiting people, uh, the poorer people. She was exposed to a lot of rural people and uh, hearing their stories, songs, which you know enhanced her, her knowledge and her, her love of um, sort of folklore and lo regional law. And then when they were in Mel Brace, one of the places she visited was the Cross Houses uh, workhouse. And uh, let me just get my papers here. Cross Houses workhouse was established towards the end of the 19th century. 
1792, and it was known as the Atcham Workhouse. Atcham being a neighbouring village attached to uh, the estate of Attingham, Attingham Hall, Attingham Park, uh, a local a local manor house, stately home. Um, 1834 Paul Law Act brought the workhouses into into higher uh, a higher role in society. Um, maybe not high in society, but uh, they they made them a lot more active. And um, there was a, the Action Poor Law Union. Uh, sorry, the Action Union. Uh, founded 18th of November, 1836, um, involved 45 parishes, which covered around 17,000 people. And the workhouse was expanded and it continued to expand through the 19th century. Uh, 1850, they included an infirmary. 1871, uh, the Shrewsbury workhouse closed down. Um, if I remember correctly, or from what I've read, it, it, it failed a kind of um, the workhouse version of the Ofsted test. This is uh, a government. Government people came and they had to look at it and they said, uh, this isn't being run properly. Close it down. Move it to Atcham. And uh, I believe male and female inmates were um, meeting and uh, socialising. And that was one of the reasons they closed it. Uh the Shrewsbury, the Shrewsbury uh, workhouse later became the Shrewsbury Boys School, which is uh, is one of the like the elite public schools in in England. Um, and it, it's quite amusing to know that it's actually based on a workhouse. Um, anyway, so uh, eighteen seventy four, there were five hundred and fifty inmates. So Mary, in the early part of the twentieth century, was visiting there, and this. Um, influenced her 1923 short story, Blessed Are the Meek, which is based in the women's ward of the, uh, of the workhouse. Um, another influence on it was that when she got married, she decided to suddenly announce she was going to invite 70 residents of the uh, Atcham workhouse to her wedding. So you can imagine this... Uh, this nice, well-to-do little wedding in this in this village, and all of a sudden, 70, 70 old people from the from the workhouse turn up. Apparently, they very much enjoyed it. One gentleman asked if he could have another piece of cake, but make it one that had done a bend in the middle. So uh, here we have our, our, our next piece of nineteenth-century uh, uh, influence on her work. Um, Incidentally, the uh, in the First World War, the Action Workhouse converted into the Barrington uh, Military Hospital. After the First World War, it reverted to being a workhouse and later became um, later became a, a hospital, uh, including a maternity hospital, um, where on the 18th of November 1965, to celebrate the 18th of November birthday of Atcham. I was born. <laughs> so I was born in I was born in the Crosshouses workhouse. Um, OK. So uh, during after the, the, the wedding, the uh, the happy couple holidayed in the Shropshire Hills. And for no other reason than to show you the beautiful Shropshire Hills of South Shropshire, uh, we'll look at the area of the Long Mind. Um, it's a plateau um, which goes several miles. You can see the kind of countryside here. Um, 19th century influence, the little town that you can see peeping over the edge there is called Church Stretton. And in uh, the 19th century, it became uh, very popular as a, uh, a holiday resort um for hill walking and uh, victorian well-to-do people it became known as little switzerland uh i think you can guess why and um so the area the area around there was quite uh quite popular there was a mill and uh and mary 
and her husband, Henry, spent a lot of time walking around the area. She wrote one of her famous poems, The, the, the Hills of Heaven, based on, based on this area. Um, okay. Along the back here, you can probably see the ridges, which I think we can see the stiper stones, which we'll meet later, uh, which were also her first couple of books. The countryside is based on uh, on the, the region around here. After, after they'd honeymooned, they went down to Western Supermare for a couple of years. And while they're down there, uh, Mary begins work on her first novel, The Golden Arrow, which um, she's also suffering quite a lot of homesickness, which she did. She never liked being out of the county. Um, so while they're away, while they're away in Western Supermare, we'll look at another major influence on her work. Charlotte Byrne. Charlotte Byrne was an amazing lady. Uh, she was uh, born in Staffordshire, which is one of the neighbouring counties to Shropshire. And when she was younger, she moved into Shropshire. Um, so we, we can forgive her for being born in Staffordshire. Uh, she was born in 1850, uh, 1850 to 1923. And she was one of the major figures in folklore, collecting and publishing. Um, she developed and uh, pushed lots of methods of collecting, recording, uh, re writing, interviewing, field work. She was one of the major field workers of the time, and it influenced really the whole discipline uh, a lot. Even today, you know, a lot of her techniques are still um, held in, in regard. In 1875, she met a lady called Georgina Frederica Jackson, who um, was collecting words for a Shropshire word book on dialect and had also done some major work. Um, uh, Georgina Jackson was un unfortunately not very healthy. Actually, Charlotte wasn't very healthy either. Um, and uh, she couldn't really continue the work, so... Charlotte Byrne took, took over. She added her own research to it. And um, 1879, Georgina Jackson's book, The Shropshire Word, Shropshire Word Book, was published. And by 1883, a combination of their work was published as Shropshire Folklore, A Sheaf of Gleanings. Um, and this is one of the most influential books in English folklore because it was the first time anything so big and so detailed, believe me, it is detailed, um, had been published. It uh, also heavily influenced Mary Webb's work because almost every piece of folklore that you find in Mary Webb's work, you can also find in Charlotte Byrne. And in her the foreword to her her book um, to Mary's novel, Precious Bane, she basically says, um, you know, I knew Charlotte Byrne uh, or I know Charlotte Byrne and uh, her work has been invaluable to me, uh, particularly for backing up things that I, I didn't have, uh, I'd only heard of and I didn't have any real record of. So uh, almost every piece of folklore that you find in Mary Webb, you will find in Charlotte Byrne. Uh, what did Charlotte go on to do? Uh, she became the first president, uh, for, sorry, first female president of the uh, English Folklore Society. Uh, she was president uh, twice, and she made the comment when in her inauguration speech that she was also probably the first female president of any learned society in Britain. And it was probably not really a joke. You know, she was um, very influential. And uh, so this is our next 19th century influence, the, the, the work of Charlotte Byrne. So returning, returning, to, uh, returning to Shropshire, 1914, obviously, uh, things are going fun at the time. We've got the First World War starting. Mary's brothers uh, eventually ended up in the front line, thankfully, 
coming home in more or less one piece. Um, I think one of them was injured. Uh, and they moved to the village of Ponsbury, which is just outside of Shrewsbury. And in the region, we're getting into the region now of Stiper Stones, not too far from the areas where she would base her work. Uh, it's the Ponsbury Hill, I hope. Uh, I think that's the Ponsbury Hill. Um, and uh, the first book, The Golden Arrow, was published. Uh, the Golden Arrow is heavily influenced by folklore, and it's based in a place called the Stiper Stones, which we'll meet in the next in the next moment. Um, the title, The Golden Arrow, comes from um, a festival, some wakes that used to happen on May Day, where people used to go up the mountain, go up the hill, uh, take the sandwiches and the butty boxes. And there was a legend of searching for a, a legendary golden arrow, which had been lost in a battle centuries before. And part of the legend, only young people could go and look for it. So the, the, the lads and the lasses would trot away hand in hand to look for the golden arrow. And uh, eventually these things got a little bit rowdy. You know, you had young guys who were getting the day off, a bit too much local cider or something like this. And uh, the, the, the wakes eventually petered out in the middle of the 19th century. So although the Golden Arrow is, uh, it, it's not really, it's not really said when it's set, but it's generally thought to be around the, you know, the, the later part of the 19th century towards the beginning of the 20th century. It's a bit ambiguous, but um, obviously Mary's using folklore, which she wasn't coming into contact with, which was from uh, about 50 years before, probably she's meeting local people who are telling her about it and, re and remembering it. Um, and so this is, uh, this is one of the influences on the book. Um, while she's around Pontsbury, she starts working on a second book, Gone to Earth. But let's move on to the Stiper Stones. Um, the Stiper Stones are a quartzite rock ridge formation. Uh, I believe they're one of the oldest, if not the oldest in Europe. Um, and they, they stretch across the hill and there are several outcrops, as you can see here, which are known as tours. Um, it's very bleak. Much is made of this unspoiled nature thing. It's not technically true. I'll come to that in a minute. Um, the place is absolutely full of folklore and legends. Um, and again, a lot of these are found in uh, Burns' work. One particular place is the Devil's Chair. And here we go. We can just see the Devil's Chair. We're approaching it from below. And here it is. I think that's the devil's chair anyway. Um, and uh, there's a wonderful legend about this, that the devil basically, this is how the Stiper Stones were formed. The devil was trotting along with a, his apron full of rocks, his apron strings snapped, and all the rocks fell everywhere, which, as you can see, you know, the whole place is full of rocks. He was so annoyed that he began to sit down on these rocks, hoping to push them into Shropshire, because the devil hates Shropshire above all other places. And if Shropshire sinks, England will, of course, sink as well, because Shropshire is the centre of centre of the world here. And uh, so uh, this is known as the devil's chair. Supposedly, you can see the devil at certain points. Um, and on... The evening of the winter solstice, which is also uh, St. Thomas's Day, uh, the witches and the ghosts of Shropshire are supposed to gather around here to elect a new leader. Um, all this features in all this features in um, the Golden Arrow. It's heaven, it's a major part of it. Um, and even today, you know, there's quite a lot made of it. Uh, there's another legend about a Saxon warrior 
uh, known as Wild Edric, who su supposedly rides across the uh, rides across the Stiper Stones on the eve of war. And he's uh, Charlotte Byrne records somebody saying they saw him before the Crimean War, uh, and he's supposedly seen before the First World War, maybe even the Second World War. Um, and he's uh, he's imprisoned underneath the Stiper Stones. Underneath the Stiper Stones are mines. He's imprisoned under there with his uh, with his elven wife, the, the the Lady Goda, kind of Arthurian situation. Um, why do I mention this? Because um, underneath the Stiper Stones are lead mines. I, I mentioned that people talk about unspoiled nature. It's not really so because the whole area around this, uh, as well as being some farming area, there were at least a dozen lead mines within the 19th and into the early 20th century. Um, lead mining had been taking place in the area uh, since the Roman times. And um, again, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, lead mining and later barite mining became very, very profitable in this region. Um, I think at one point, 33% of the produce uh, of, of lead and barites in Britain came just from this area. And it's not a, it's not a huge area. Um, so let's have a look. With these mines, there were, of course, miners. And in, uh, in the Golden Arrow, it talks about the protagonists, Deborah Arden and Stephen Southernwood, who is her, her errant husband. Uh, he works down the mine. They take a little cottage um, just below the devil's chair. And it, it never occurred to me, actually, when I, when I first read it, that I'd never seen a cottage in that area. And then a couple of years ago, that the last time I was at the Stiper Stones uh, with my mother, um, I went to walk on the tours. She stayed down with the car. When I came back, she had a big bowl of Wimberries and a bag of Cheshire potatoes. And as you can see, there aren't very many shops in that area. And I went, how on earth did you get those? Only my mother did kind of thing. And she'd met a couple from Cheshire, and they'd, they'd been picking Wimberries. And... Uh, the Stiper Stones were actually well known as a burying place, a good place to go and pick berries. Um, one of the uh, one of the, the stones is uh, the cranberry cranberry rock, um, and these people had said, "Oh, our grandpa my grandparents used to live on a cottage on the Stiper Stones," and that piqued my interest. I did a little bit of research, uh, asked a few people, and there was communities there were several communities around there of these um miners cottages um and what i found out recently was that uh, although most of them are destroyed most of them have fallen to pieces there was still evidence of some when mary webb was there so she would have been influenced by this and there's even one uh, there were there was one ruined cottage that people called the Mary Webb Cottage because they thought it was the one that she wrote about in um, the Golden Arrow. In recent years, uh, some of the cottages have been restored, and you can now you can now see them. They're, they're, they're kind of tourist resorts. You can see them at the bottom here, um, and uh, these I think they were lived in until 1955. Um, so that they, they, they were still active. Um, also, a lot of stones to build local buildings were taken from the Stiper Stones. Um, a great book on this is called The Singular Stiper Stones by Tom Wall. It's a wonderful book, but it's been out of print, which is a crime against humanity because um, it, it, it gives all the social background, the nature background, and uh, this really is a fascinating place. And so this, this, um, this mining 
uh, this mining community enters into uh, the Golden Arrow. Um, just below the Stiper Stones, uh, the remains of the, the Snail Beach lead mines. Um, this is one of the better known ones, and it was one of the ones that lasted until, I think, the 1930s, possibly until the 1950s. I'm not totally sure. Um, and it's now it's now a museum. And uh, in Gone to Earth, Stephen Southernwood works in the, the, the Lost Within Mines. They call it the Lost Within Mines. And it basically reflects his state of mind. Uh, Deborah is a shepherd's daughter. She's uh, kind of at one with the earth, the nature, the flowers, uh, the devil's chair, even though she's scared of it. Um, she uh, um, she uh, is more at one with herself. Stephen is a bit of a townie. He comes as a preacher and... As we'll see in a moment, there were a lot of nonconformist chapels around the area, um, one of which at the moment has a display of uh, Mary Webb's history and, and works there. Uh, I think that's in Snail Beach. And um, so the Snail, Beach, the Snail Beach mines were very important. Uh, nearby as well, there was another one called the Bog. The, the village isn't there anymore. It was demolished pretty much, I think, the 1970s. Uh, just the school is there now as a, as a visitor's centre. Um, what's interesting with uh, uh, the Golden Arrow is Mary Webb writes incredibly about countryside. Um, her descriptions of the landscape are very vivid. And one might think there would be a kind of Dickensian juxtaposition of the horrible minds and the beauties of nature. And for some reason, she doesn't do that. Uh, I'm not totally sure why. Uh, um, maybe she just chose not to not to visit the, the, the areas, but I, I, I don't know. She was a very free-minded uh, lady. Uh, might just be that it was just too ugly. And she was too much in love with nature to to actually take a deep description about the place. Um, but uh, certainly that mining area, that mining society enters into her work um, in several different places. One of which is Lord's Hill. If we look on the picture there of the the mine here on the on the on the right you can just see the lord's hill peeping behind it um the lord's hill appears in gone to earth as god's little mountain and the chapel in god's little mount on god's little mountain is based on the um the baptist chapel on the top of lord's hill if anyone watches the 1951 film of gone to earth you will see the Stiper Stones in amazing glory, and you will also see this chapel uh, and a lot of local people involved. It's really, really worth watching. Um, the chapel at Lord's Hill is where Hazel eventually meets her husband and, uh, and they settle down here. And uh, as I said before, this is an example where the geography in Mary Webb's books occasionally uh, cross-references other parts of the county. The quarry we talked about is supposed to be outside of this chapel. Um, there isn't really a quarry out there. There are several mine shafts, which the last time I was there, somebody told me that some of them were around 2,000 feet deep and they went into the, the, the snail beach mines i think i think they were like ventilation uh shafts so um in the film interestingly enough they they feature more as mine shafts than a quarry um but as you can see in the pictures here that this one on the bottom right there's still a, a chimney stack there from i think smelting works or something like this 
Um, and you've got a lot of what is now open countryside, but this is also the area where these uh, restored cottages are. So that there would have been a few more cottages in that area, people working, doing farming. They, they uh, ran their own little plots. Uh, some of them had ponies. Also in this area, it's an area called the Hollies, and there are some ancient holly trees there, which the hollies are actu were actually used for feeding livestock. Uh, it's an incredibly beautiful place, which for some reason I only discovered a couple of years ago. Uh, I don't know why. Um, so the cottages, as I mentioned before, there was a, a common, there was an idea that there was a common law that if you built a cottage overnight out of stone and you had smoke coming out the chimney in the morning, that you could stay there. You could claim squatters' rights and stay there, albeit you might have to pay some rent. And uh, apparently this law doesn't really exist, uh, even in common law, but nobody really minded because it was advantageous to both groups. So a lot of the local landowners, they would, um, they would uh, allow people to build there because they could get a nominal rent on land that they weren't normally using. People got to stay there. Um, eventually, when the land wanted to be reused, these houses were allowed to fall destitute. Uh, the question of landowning is very central to the Lord's Hill Chapel. Um, two of the major landowners in the area were the Marquis of Bath and Lord Tankerville. And they had a little tiff about hunting rights, about hunting rights on each other's land. Uh, then one day, the local community decided they would like to build a chapel, a Baptist chapel. So they went to the Marquis of Bath and they said, you know, you know, sir, could we, could we build this chapel? He was very high Anglican and he wanted nothing to do with these ruffian, common, uh, non-conformists. You know, non Good grief, you know. Um, so he said no. So knowing about this dispute they'd had, he'd had with Tankerville, they then went to Tankerville and he said, yeah, sure, I'll give you the land and I'll help you build it. Build it right there, right on the edge of the borderline between my land and uh, the Marquis, Marquis of Bath's land. So it's kind of two fingers to the Marquis of Bath. Um, the The... The, the chapel last time I was there was being restored, um, but it's uh, the, it still has a practicing congregation, um, although I don't think they use the chapel at the moment. Um, so again, this features in Gone to Earth. It's, it's where Hazel lives and uh, eventually has an adventure on the edge of a quarry. Um, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't read it too much. Uh, there's a picture of Hazel and her pet fox, which some of you might notice. She looks a little bit like Jennifer Jones, the American film star um, in 1951. Uh, and the, the practice fox hunting, uh, again, kind of 19th century into the 20th century, features very heavily in Gone to Earth. Uh, and it also reflects aspects of this legend of the uh, of the wild Edric, the Saxon lord who chases over. But I'm not going to go too much into that because it would spoil it for anyone who's not read the book. Uh, incidentally, Mary Webb's father was a member of the Much Wenlock Hunt, which uh, I, I don't know that she held it against him, but she was, as I say, an animal lover, uh, vegetarian. Uh, and very much into nature, so it must have hurt her a little bit. Um, so there's a, some more countryside around the area. As you can see now, the the mining the mining's really gone, and uh, it's mainly farming area now. So we're moving up country a little bit for uh, Mary's fifth novel, uh, which is Precious Bane. Precious Bane takes place at the, during the Napoleonic Wars, up until the, it's the uh, the first two decades 
but maybe the first three decades of the 19th century. And this is very instrumental towards the story. Um, it's based up in what we call the Lake District of Shropshire, an area um, where we have mirrors, kind of lakes. Uh, and um, although this is actually Ellesmere, um, which is the, the main town in that area, um, the actual lake, the, the, the Sarn Lake, the Sarn Mere in the book is probably more based on the Bowmere, Bowmere, uh, Bowmere, Bowmere Mere, uh, which is nearer to Shrewsbury. Uh, however, Mary moves the stories up into North Shropshire. And uh, as you can see, uh, still very, very much traditional buildings. And she brings a lot of folklore. Again, a lot of this stuff coming from Burns. And this is really where she enters a stride. Unfortunately, it was to be the last of her last of her main novels. Um, one of the things she introduces is sin eating. Uh, the main protagonist, Prudence Sarn, or Prue, uh, is a farmer's daughter. She's got a hair lip, so she's considered to be bewitched or a witch herself. Uh, her brother, Gideon, is an incredibly fiery young man, and he has an argument with his father. His father dies of a heart attack. And Gideon is going to get the farm. He has decided he is going to get the farm. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, there were tariffs, what we call the Corn Laws, and these restricted foreign imports into, into Britain. Um, Gideon knows about this, so he is going all out to make as much money as he can with his farming and getting the farm, modernising the farm, modernising the tactics, getting a lot more farming. This is his thing. And this is his precious bane. The, the name precious bane comes from uh, um, Milton. And this is the, the sort of terrible curse somebody's got for Prue. It's her hair lip. For Gideon, it's his uh, uh, avaricious nature, his, his love of gold. Um, near the beginning of the book, the, the father has died, and in the funeral, they call for a sin eater. Um, and the sin eater is somebody who comes, and as we can see in the picture there, they pass food across the body, they take the food, and they give a little prayer, and this it's a it's a kind of last rites, but a bit later, you know, um, it's a last chance, last rites. So it absolves the sin from the uh, from the dead person, takes the sin from the dead person. The problem is it goes into the sin eater. So sin eaters are considered very dubious spiritual characters. They're kind of uh, spiritual trash men, you know, spiritual dustbin men. Um, Usually the poorest people, the outcasts, are the ones who were uh, considered for it. And uh, so at the wedding, they call for a sin eater. And Mary says, we normally used to get them from the, uh, or Prue says, we normally get them from the hills. So probably into Wales, somewhere like this. Um, and there's no sin eater. Be there a sin eater, she cried, cried mother pitifully. Father had died in his wrath with all his sins upon him. And besides, he died in his boots, which is a very unkept thing and bodes no good. So she thought he needed, he was in great need of a sin eater and she would not be comforted. Then a strange heart shaking thing came to pass. Gideon stepped up to the coffin and said, there is a sin eater. Who then? I see none, said the sexton. I'll be the sin eater. He took up the pewter measure full of darkness and he looked at mother. Who turn over the farm and all to me if I be the sin eater, mother? 
No, no, sin eaters be accursed. What harm to drink a sup of your own wine and crumble a crust of your own bread? If you don't care, let be. He can go with all the sin on him. No, leave and go free, Gideon. Let and rest, poor soul. You be in life and young, him cold and helpless and the power of Satan. If there's none else to help him, let his own lad take the pity. And you'll give me the farm, mother? Yes, yes, my dear. What be the farm to me? I can take all and welcome. Then Gideon drank the wine all of a gulp and swallowed the crust. There was no sound at all in the place. He put his hand on the coffin, standing up tall in the high black hat with a gleaming pale face. He said, I give easement and rest now to thee, dear man. Come not down the lanes, nor in our meadows. For thy peace I pawn my own soul. Amen. There was a sigh from everyone then, like the wind in the dry bents. So Gideon curses himself by taking the sin eating. Now, the interesting thing with the sin eating is um, Mary writes in a foreword that it was well known in Shropshire. And again, we find an account of it in Charlotte Byrne. But even Charlotte Byrne says that the account was from the 17th century, recounting a story someone had heard about 30 years before. So we're talking possibly as back as the 16th century, and there is very, very little evidence, if any, that sin eating was a common practice, uh, and particularly a standardised practice, um, uh, as widely as a lot of people are thinking. And there's very little evidence that it was that widespread in Shropshire. Um, however, why? Why would this suddenly come about? Why would we think about this? In the Golden Arrow, the village of Slip, where uh, um, Deborah Arden's family live, is possibly based on a little village called Ratchup. Uh, you'll see it written as Rattling Hope, as Ratchup. And in Ratchup, there is a grave of a man called Richard Munslow, who died in 1906 and is known as the Last Sin Eater because local legend would have it that when his young daughters died during a, a, an epidemic of an illness, he resorted to sin eating. Now, he wasn't an outcast. He was quite a well-to-do farmer. You can see his grave there. Um, his family are actually mentioned in a 1930s book about Mary Webb country. They don't mention the sin eating bit, but then I, I don't suppose it was something that families advertised. Um, so Mary living around the area at that time uh, more than likely came across this. This is supposition on my part. Um, she more than likely came across these local legends, uh, the knowledge of uh, Richard Munslow, who would have been the last sin eater in the, in the 19th century. And uh, possibly, possibly this influenced her um, idea for writing. Um, as I say, supposition on my part. Um, things go on in uh, um, Precious Bane. Gideon becomes more and more avaricious and uh, eventually uh, the, the question of cursed, uh, a cursed person comes to play and it's, it's, it's all full of dark misery, all good stuff. You really have to read it, folks. Um, at some point, Prue meets the itinerant weaver, uh, Kester. And Kester Woods Eves is an itinerant weaver, and he's also a champion wrestler, which, as some of you know, is a, is a little interest of mine. And there's a certain point in the book where there is uh, a bull baiting. There's going to be bull baiting. The bulls were brought, they were tied, and dogs were set on them, uh, partly because it's fun, uh, but also because it tenderizes the meat. All the, all the chemicals in the body tenderize the meat. And um, 
so there, there was a practice of, uh, of um, baiting bulls before um, before slaughter in at some of the some of the wakes in the north of Shropshire, in the Lake District. There is a little town called a little village called Loppington, and Loppington is the site of the last remaining bull baiting ring in Shropshire. And we can see it there on the on the, the left hand side. I was expecting like a matador's ring when I read about it, but it's it's the metal ring that they used to tie the bulls to. Uh, in the local church, there's a big tradition of uh, crocheting and embroidery. And this top picture is actually a, a, a prayer cushion. You go in there, all the prayer cushions are, are crocheted and embroidered. It's a lovely place to visit. Um, and uh, you can see there, they've got the picture of the bull baiting. The last baiting in Loppington was in 1822, but it wasn't a bull, it was a bear. The local vicar decided to get his daughter a birthday present and uh, hire a bear to get baited. Uh, and interestingly enough, in um, uh, Charlotte Burns' book, there's also a song called The Loppington Bar, which is about an old cobbler who goes out one night and he swears he sees a bear and he, rakes, he wakes up all the town to come and chase the bear away and it turns out to be a lump of wood somewhere. Um, so there's, there's a lot of connections with baiting. And again, supposition on my part, but the geography of the book being up in the Mears, uh, the fact that this is the last baiting ring in the county uh, and bull baiting, bull baiting, bear baiting finished. It was banned in 1835. So again, supposition on my part, perhaps, but I would like to think that this is also something which influenced uh, Mary's inclusion of the, the bull baiting scene in Precious Bane. Uh, interest, there's an interesting tradition with this ring as well. If you turn the ring over in front of someone, you're challenging them to a fight. And uh, there's a little photograph in the, in the local pub of some boys posing next to the ring, turning it over and having a fight. Um, and I've come across this tradition in a couple of other places. Um, and it's interesting that if you read uh, Hardy's Mayor of Casterbridge, there is a big punch up between two groups of workers and it happens at the old baiting, the old uh, bull ring. So uh, again, I, I wonder how much of the uh, Hardy influence we also see coming in there. Um, okay, so I'm coming to the end now. Uh, Mary, as I said, unfortunately, her Graves disease got worse and towards the Precious Bane was the, the high point of her literary career. Um, it, it won prizes when it was published. Uh, 1925, she won a prize for it. Um, unfortunately, her next book, she was not in a good place mentally at the time. Her marriage was breaking up. She destroyed the manuscript, tried to rewrite it, and there's only fragments of her uh, what would have been a sixth novel. Um, she wrote several short stories. She's also well known as a poet. Um, she's done some beautiful poetry there and some essays. Um, but by um, 1927, she uh, she was ill. She'd moved to a nursing home in the south of England and, and unfortunately she died there. Uh, she was buried in Shrewsbury, and there's a there's a, a memorial to her, a bust of her, which I believe the Mary Webb Society helped uh, helped found. And um, the next year, the Prime Minister, Mr. Baldwin, stood up at a speech and said how wonderful Mary Webb was. She was this amazing treasure that people didn't know of, and her popularity soared. Um, during a lifetime, she was very well-known and respected by other writers, uh, such as uh, Rachel West, John Buchan, uh, Walter Delamere, people like this, all 
realized she was this this great writer, but unfortunately, the public didn't take to her work. Her popularity went up, um, obviously after her death, and then eventually went down as the fashion for um, uh, kind of rural melodramas began to fade. Uh, and so uh, she um, she's not as not as well known as she should be. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping a few of you might search her out now if you haven't already. Uh, and we'll return to Much Wenlock, where there's uh, a little memorial in the town, also to to Mary, which is just behind that black and white building that I showed you in the, in the earlier picture. So uh, there we have it. Um, as I say, so that this was my attempt at showing some of the 19th century influences on her work, both geographically and literary, and. Uh, I hope hope that's been of interest to everybody. Thank you.